Good evening. I would like to call the Melville School District December 15th, 2022 school board meeting to order. If we could please all rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We have a full house, standing room only. It's been a while since I've seen that. Um, if I could do a roll call, please. Uh, Jeff Woolman? Yes. Scott Hugerich? Yes. Tori Belke? Yes. Jean Preto? Yes. Grace Wright? Yes. Patrick McKelvey? Yes. And I'm Peggy Hassler. I would also like to introduce our student rep that's here. Her name is Jenna Jobber. Is that right? Did I say it right? All right. And our other student rep is Eric Plasser, but he is not here as of right now. So thank you guys for volunteering to be part of the board. If I could please get a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Communications. We have recognition of staff, students, and community volunteers. I believe first we'll hear from Trotwine, Dr. Shannon Henderson or Michelle Woods. Both of you? Okay. Good evening. I am proud to um, share uh, members of our buddy club with you this evening. They are the, the students are going to take over. Um, I want to first introduce Miss Warren. Come on up, guys. Don't be bashful. I want to first introduce Miss Warren, our school counselor, and Miss Briscoe, one of our special education teachers. And I'm going to turn it over to the kids now. Greetings, my name is Draken, and I'm the founding member of the Buddy Club. Everyone let me tell you how the Buddy Club started. Last year in third grade, I was playing with my friends Zayden and others. I noticed that no one else played with them, and an idea came to mind. I should start a club. I told Miss Warren about my idea. She accepted it and helped me present it to Dr. Henderson, who approved. Hello, my name is Patty Paraka. Last year in third grade, Miss Warren and Dragon recruited me and four other students to play and eat lunch with our students in the center based classroom. I said yes, and we started playing with all students in rotation. Hello, my name is Corey Barnes. Last year in fourth grade, Amina and I noticed that Chloe and other students were playing by themselves. We talked to the center based teacher and decided from that day on we would play with them. We hung out with them whenever we could. We have all become best friends. Hello, my name is Amina Mesic. The Buddy Club has developed into official club this year. We are inviting all first through fifth grade students to join. The club has grown from five students to currently having about 30 students this year. A buddy is someone who pays attention to the most vulnerable students, students that may be in the blue zone or red zones, and new students. Hello, my name is Medine Ramich. We would like for Buddy Club to be a school-wide philosophy, not just a club, but a way of life at Troutwine. We would like for Buddy Club... We would like for... Not just a club, but a way of life at Troutwine. We would like to see Buddy Club in all our schools throughout the Melville School District. Thank you to Miss Warren and all the Buddy Club. Thank you for your time. I just have to say that that is probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Makes me want to cry. So thank you. And I agree with you 100%. We need to have one of these in every one of our schools. Yeah. Good. So good job, guys.
Before you guys all leave, I wanted, if you're going to leave, I wanted to let you know that this meeting is recorded on YouTube if you'd like to see your children speak. It's already recorded and up there. Just follow the link through the Melville School District website. Uh huh. Okay. Should I move far? Okay, next up we have Woolwin, Dr. Dave Meshke, and his students. Sorry, I just wanted it to be quiet so we can also honor your children. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I can be loud if I need to be, right? Well, good evening. My name is Michelle Wood, and I have the privilege of being the assistant principal at Woolwin and at Troutwine. I think it's just a night of celebration tonight. Um, our Student of the Month celebration is a big deal at Woolwin, and we are so proud of all of these students um, for all of their accomplishments. Really, what we really practice is following the wildcat way, which means being respectful, responsible, and safe, and that encompasses so many different things. Um, so, normally each month we have families join our celebration team at Woolwin, and we go into our Students of the Month class and we surprise them, um, and we invite their families to join us. Um, so tonight, this evening, we wanted to recognize our December Students of the Month here and to be able to celebrate with all of you guys. Um, so our Kindergarten Student of the Month for December is Kalila Simmons, and her teacher, Ms. Geisler, says Kalila has consistently shown integrity and honesty throughout the school day, and she can be counted on to do the right thing and always has a positive attitude. One of the things she admires most about Kalila is that she so shows empathy and support for her classmates each day. And so Dr. Meshke has some yard signs that when uh, we celebrate with our students of the month, they get uh, those signs and get to put them in their yards and celebrate. Um, so like I said, it's a big deal at Woolwin. We're so excited about it. Everybody in the neighborhood of it. Yeah. So our first grade student of the month for December is Olivia Wynn. And Ms. Davis says Olivia is consistently responsible and respectful. She is such a positive presence to have in the classroom and is always eager to try her hand at learning new things. Our second grade student of the month is Adeline Blunt. Ms. Carl says Adeline is an amazing second grader who demonstrates kindness to everyone and goes out of her way to include others. Adeline is very in tune to her peers and shows empathy always to those who need it. She has really worked so hard daily, showing tremendous growth in everything this school year. You can kind of step forward so we can see who you are, too. <laughs> Our third grade student of the month is Ruby Johnson. Ms. Brogan says Ruby consistently shows kindness and support for her classmates. She is hardworking and always puts forth her best effort. Her thoughtfulness and positive attitude is an asset to her classroom. Our fourth grade student of the month is Jace Blackman. Ms. Timmerman says Jace has uh, been a wonderful, help helpful, and fun student to have in fourth grade. He is a hard worker, and is, he is a leader in their classroom in regards to his work and behavior. And last but not least, our fifth grade student of the month is Cooper Schlake. Ms. Brady says that Cooper has been a great example of a role model and leader to his peers and other students at Woolwin from day one. When asking his teachers to describe him, Cooper is thought as driven, reliable, confident, a great friend, and a team player. So we are so very proud of all of these amazing students for all that they do at Woolwind each and every day. And it was a pleasure recognizing them and celebrating with all of you this evening. Thank you. Congratulations, you guys. Thank you for being such awesome role models. <laughs>
Okay, moving on to open period for patron comments. We do have one person, Rebecca Bahora, signed up to speak. Um, I would love to be able to oh, give... Oh, we have to do the MNEA. So sorry. No problem. It said it behind you, so I knew I was there. It says it in front of me, too, and I, I just, I blew that one. I apologize. It's no big deal. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Dina McKelvey, and I'm president of Melville NEA, and this is my favorite part of being able to introduce you to some of these great kids across the district. So I'm going to start with Ella Roth because we did give her award last week, but she didn't know that we did that. So she's here tonight, so if she could approach the podium. Ella Roth is a student at Oakville High School, and her teacher couldn't be here tonight, but she wanted me to let you know that Ella Roth is a freshman, and Ella is a hard worker in Spanish class. She is diligent and focused, and she always has her work done, completes extra credit, and she is helpful to her classmates. Ella catches on really quickly in Spanish. She is funny and witty, too, and I have loved having her in class. So, Our next student is from Troutwine, and that is Sage Brumette. If the student and the teacher could please approach the podium. Hi, I'm Sue Mazak. Um, I actually got to work with Sage when he, she first came to Troutwine as a second grader, but her teacher now is Miss Emily Thiel, and Sage Brumette is a lovely young girl. Sage exemplifies what it means to be a tiger of integrity each and every day. She walks into Troutwine with a positive attitude that spreads to every person she interacts with. Sage greets others with a hello and a huge smile on her face. Sage shows leadership by modeling expected behaviors throughout the day, and she works hard to actively participate in her learning. She strives to meet academic goals and continues to push herself as a learner. Sage is a genuine, caring, and compassionate friend to those around her. She helps her peers by finding missing items or explaining the directions in a different way. She never complains and she's always eager to help out when, she, when and wherever she can. We're so proud of the young lady she is today and we can't wait to see the kind of great accomplishments she has in store for her in future. All right, and now from Woolwin, I have the pleasure of asking Noah Sanchez and his teacher to please approach the podium. Well, we're gonna have, it won't be until after he's done. Hello. So one thing that we always want for our kids is to be kind when no one is looking. So our third grade class voted to have a pizza party. Each child was supposed to bring in money and at one point, Noel was worried about how much money was being brought in, so he went home and asked his mom if he could use his money in his own piggy bank so that every kid could get a slice of pizza. He didn't do it for recognition. He didn't even know anyone would know. He did it because his classmates, he all wanted them to get a piece of pizza. So it makes me, <laughs> it makes me tear up. Um, he was willing to use his own money to make that happen. Noah is such a kind student, and we are so proud of how he represents Woolwind. That concludes our presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I missed you. Congratulations, Ella, Sage, and Noah. That's awesome. Okay, now we are moving on to open period for patron comments, and we have Rebecca Bahora signed up. Uh, Rebecca, you have three minutes allotted for your uh, 
speaking and the time limit will be strictly enforced. The board is accountable to the state for protecting the legal rights of the schools, employees, students, parents, and others. Discussion of individuals or specific situations will not be allowed. The board will strictly enforce these rules and speakers will be interrupted if they discuss matters that might violate board rules and policy. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a mom to three children at Beerbaum Elementary. I have a fifth grader, a second grader, and a kindergartner. And I'm also the PTO president at Beerbaum. In the September board meeting, Dr. Gaines asked what kind of school district do we want in the next three to five years? We've seen a lot of great information being presented lately, and we've also heard some conversations about tax rate increases. Tonight, I wanted to share my perspective as a taxpayer, a school volunteer, and as a mom. To say the least, I'm at our school quite a bit, and it gives me a pretty unique up-close view into our school. I'm like that house guest that comes like before you're ready for company, so I see the real, I see the mess, and quite honestly, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. The pressure being placed on our schools and our educators is high, and some would argue with the staffing issues and the post-pandemic issues, the pressure is like none other. Even with these unique pressures, though, our schools are making it happen. My kids get picked up and dropped off every day, my kids are learning, and they are growing. So some may argue, don't fix what isn't broken, and some may call it being fiscally responsible, but I feel like that logic is flawed. Our educators and our staff deserve fair and competitive salaries. They're people, they have homes, and they have families. Our children also deserve to have the best teachers out there, teachers that can be retained and given the opportunity and time to excel, grow, and flourish. They shouldn't have to choose between being loyal to our district and a fair salary. As you all know, Beerbaum is a huge school. We have more than 500 students, and that's a lot of different learning styles and a lot of different behaviors that teachers need to accommodate. High quality teachers that know our school, our families, and our students' situations is a key piece. We've seen so much data on the benefit of math and reading interventionists, but sometimes it's hard to quantify the social and emotional data. With our ESSER positions, we have seen the important work that is happening in social and emotional learning. We are seeing that kids that need that little extra help, the ones that may have been left to work it on their own before, exceed. My youngest, who recently started kindergarten, fell into this category. We did all the right things leading up to kindergarten. We um, you know, put him in preschool at Beer Bomb. He was up at the school all the time with me. We practiced drop-off. He knew the school in and out, top to bottom. Unfortunately, though, kindergarten was a tough, tough transition for him. He was overwhelmed and overstimulated. He cried every single morning for the first two weeks, and every morning our SEL would come down to the office, hold his hand, and walk him to his classroom. He would also sit with him into the, in the classroom until he calmed down. Now Max walks past our SEL with a high five and a smile. It's the cutest thing ever. It seems so small and insignificant, but it set Max up with the confidence that he needed. This isn't the only student that it's happening to, and it's not the only example. But no matter the issue, when a teacher has to choose between helping one student and 18 others who are waiting for them, it's a ripple effect. These extra hands help everyone. So in conclusion, and to answer Dr. Gaines's question, no matter what side you support, I think we can all agree that we want what is best for our children. Being able to retain and reward high quality teachers and staff is good for all children. I would love to see our board vote on and give taxpayers the option to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to governance. We have first up the audit report, Marshall Crutcher. All right, our auditors are Daniel Jones and Associates. And this year to present the annual audit report is Desi Kirchhofer. Thank you, Marshall, and good evening, everybody. Um, so on behalf of Daniel Jones and Associates, I would like to thank the board for giving us this opportunity to audit Melville School District for the year ending June 30th, 2022. First off, I'd like to thank Marshall and Carrie. Uh, they have had a fair share of requests from us and have responded quickly both day and night and got us all the items we needed and organized which is always a huge help, so thank you, Marshall. Uh, the district had a minor state finding regarding the use of a separate bank accounts for all debt service funds. Section 165.011 RSMO requires the debt service funds to be maintained in a separate bank account. The purpose of the statute is that the district is not using those funds for operations. In this case, the district does maintain a separate bank account for 
debt service, but there were funds that were in the general account that had not been transferred to the debt service bank account. Although this is very minor, it is something that is required to be reported on. So basically, we as auditors are to look at the district and issue opinions as to whether or not the school district has presented fairly in all material respects, or has any material misstatements in their financial data, internal control, or federal programs. The audit is basically broken into three parts, financial statements, state requirements, and federal awards. We issued an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, and this is the highest mark a district can receive and means this was a clean audit without issues. Second, through our testing, we found the district to be in compliance with state requirements relating to attendance, transportation, and budgetary procedures. And finally, the district expended more than $750,000 in federal awards, which means they were subject to a single audit. We have issued an unmodified opinion for compliance with federal awards, and again, this is the highest opinion a district can receive. So in closing, I would like to congratulate the school district on having an excellent audit and thank the board for giving us this opportunity. I'm open to any questions too, if needed. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions other than what's already been asked on eBoards? So for the audience, the entire audit report, 72 pages, I believe, is on eBoards along with the board's questions. But if anybody has anything else after the presentation, we can. I just also wanted to say, Desi is an Oakville alumni and his father is a Melville High School alumni, so. Honored to be here. <laughs> We appreciate it. Um, but yes, so everything we saw, that, that was the only, you already explained the one little tidbit yeah. of, that wasn't a big deal from what I understand. Um, so great job, Marshall and the rest of the district. And yeah. thank you for doing the audit. Anybody else? Yeah, All right. I can't stress enough how much we appreciate the, the support from yeah. Marshall and Carrie. They helped us a ton. They were very organized, which is not like every district, so thank you. Okay, so are we ready? All right, so if I could please get a motion to approve the audit report as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Consider Melville High School Dish Machine bid, Katie Gag. Good evening. So I am here to ask for approval for a new dish machine at the very oh so busy Melville High School. Um, the current dish machine is older. Uh, I guess it would be 30 plus. Um, it's still running, but it has its days when it gives them a little hiccups here and there. And just to, to continue to be an efficient uh, kitchen, you need uh, all your equipment working properly, so on the plan to replace it. So uh, we're hoping to get this work done over spring break, so that's why I'm bringing it to you now as opposed to this summer. So we sent it out for bids and we received two bids back. Um, I am recommending Belter, who we have worked with multiple times in the past, purchased several pieces of equipment through them. I'm very confident in their capabilities, great communication. Thankfully, it doesn't have a very long lead time uh, on that piece of equipment, so it should be here uh, before spring break, and Hobart will hold on to it uh, before they come do the install. So um, I'm recommending the lowest bidder of Belter. They're qualified, and I welcome any questions you might have. Does anybody have anything? I just got one silly question. <laughs> How many dishes does this thing run through on the average hour? Oh. Because um, I know what my dishwasher does, and I should have asked this earlier, but I just had that moment of, I wonder how many dishes this thing does in an hour. A well, lot. It's a lot. It's a, it's a conveyor, so it's constantly going. Well, Dr. Gaines, Dr. DeKemper, Tons. we all... Uh, I was going to ask in the meantime. That. So we know that machine well. Does somebody have to hand wash all of them before yeah. it's... No, no, we just I'm rinse kidding. them off. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there was some scrubbing. There is some scrubbing <laughs> involved. Okay. Sometimes okay. on some trays, but a considerable amount. It's okay. mainly a lot of the, the student trays. That's mainly what we're doing. There is a three compartment sink where we do a lot of the scrubbing of the, the steam well pans and everything else like that. But they do on a you know, good 700 lunches a day. That's a lot of so, dishes. That's a lot of trays, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I All make right. a motion? Yes, if I can get a motion to approve the dish machine and installation package from Bolter, who sub 
submitted the lowest qualified bid totaling $65,770. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank, Thank you, you, Katie. All right, next up is considered 23-24 school calendar, Dr. Brian Smith. Good evening, everybody. Um, over the course of six hours, beginning in late October and going to just before Thanksgiving, the academic calendar committee consisted of about 30 people, certified and classified administrators, parents, um, support staff members, teachers, central office members. Um, and so we had the opportunity to engage in some conversation around the establishment of the 23-24 academic calendar. As part of eBoards, uh, the public will find and those that are here um, can see displayed, we have a calendar that has some, meets all the minimum qualifications that it needs to. Uh, it's at least 1,044 hours in length. Uh, it has at least 36 hours of uh, inclement weather days built in. Uh, it has three and a half days of teacher work days as part of the MOU, uh, 174 days for students and 182 days for staff. And so um, we consulted, this year was the first year we did a thought exchange as well to try to solicit the input from the community uh, so that we could get an idea of exactly what was important to them. Uh, we had 1,253 responses and it looks like a little over 1,300 participants. So, uh, and that ranged uh, obviously from our students to our employees to our families and parents overall. Um, also annually I do a, a feedback form um, asking similar questions about all the big dates that you would typically see on a calendar and what their recommendations and what their personal preferences were. So the calendar that's presented before you um, has all the color coding marked on it for first days and last days. Uh, you can see that the first day uh, is the Tuesday after the first Monday of which we can start um, because of state law around the uh, tourism industry piece. And the last day on the calendar, uh, as it is marked, would be the Wednesday after Memorial Day. So um, in a calendar committee situation, as I've learned very quickly, uh, there's no pleasing everyone. And many times there's very pleasing very few. Um, but there were a lot of compromises and negotiations that went into the process. And this was a calendar that the committee unanimously said that they could, they could live with in terms of the implementation. So this one, after any comments or questions that you may have, would simply require board action to be able to approve. I just wanted to make a comment that I just appreciated um, that you mentioned the um, state law that now requires us to not be able to start um, because that has a big effect on our, our calendar. It and, does. Uh, I think uh, some people don't recognize that, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and also um, I'd like to add that I did go through the calendar and the survey that you provided the results of the survey and you certainly hit on every top of the, the he most heavily weighted choices of the survey while like you said you can't make everybody happy um you did a good job and i don't think there was in there was no way to exchange well if they wanted to do this what could we look at to change and there really is no room there to change any of it so um great job and thank you for all the time and effort that everybody put in sure it was the first time we had to go to a third meeting um so we spent some extra time on it uh, my job was simply to facilitate that really the the credit goes to the committee for taking the time out of their days and nights to be able to, to get this done. Right. Thank you, committee. Anybody else? Okay. If I could please get a motion to approve the 2324 Melville School District calendar as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the strategic plan update, employee support, Dr. Shannon Pike. Good evening. Okay, so tonight, um, my presentation covers and centers on employee support, one of the five themes um, in the strategic plan, focusing more on um, our employee um, component of it, um, and really that looks deeply into um, 
supporting goals um, and understanding that our workforce is an integral part in supporting our workforce, achieving both individual and organizational goals, using baseline data and the use of ongoing methods of analysis um, for that data, both um, identifying any necessary change that we may see that supports our workforce. So we look at key individuals um, within that um, strategic theme, senior district leadership, human resources, classified directors, building level leadership, communications department, and the district's workforce to some degree. So some key areas to positively impact our employee support are outlined within the strategic plan. First, we're gonna continuously focus on a stream of identifying and researching um, and examining how we're gonna continue to support and attract and recruit and retain all of the individuals that we have within our, there it is, our, um, our workforce. Second, we're gonna identify targeted personalized PD for our staff. We're gonna analyze our onboarding and our mentoring program that we currently have and ensure that that is strengthened from the time our employees walk into our district and throughout their tenure here. Most importantly, those first two years are key. We know that for our certified staff, not just teachers, but administrators, that is key um, to holding on to them and, and retaining them overall um, beyond just their first two years, but beyond that three to five year um, bubble, but also for our classified staff. Um, engaging with them within those first 60 days to ensure that we are supporting them beyond that. Um, also reviewing opportunities to um, analyze employee engagement through feedback and participation with our employees and continuing to address the benefits of inclusivity, um, equity, and diversity to develop a workforce that reflects and represents our community. So all five of these areas um, within the employee support um, are strategies that we're cont continuously examining um, all the time. So just as in years past, we're constantly analyzing salary comparisons and later on tonight, um, you will hear a co salary comparison um, from Dr. Gaines. He will go into detail on that. Um, so that is um, following this presentation. This year, we continuously brainstorm ways to reach candidates by hosting on-site job interviews. These are called our open interviews, with even narrowing our focus specifically to departments. We're excited about these interviews. We've had huge success um, bringing candidates to um, these open interviews and embracing um, them here. And, and so we are now expanding those and actually um, just having those interviews by departments. Those new um, open interviews will be held in January and February. Um, we have a department on-site interview uh, for transportation in January and then for food service and for our custodial staff and then we're actually kicking off a substitute um, specifically focused on our substitutes in February. I also meet regularly with our um, classified leadership team um, to determine what their needs are in terms of the hiring process as well. Our curriculum team in collaboration with our building administrators gained feedback for our staff to understand the ongoing needs of our certified staff and what professional development is needed. Additionally, in HR, we're constantly looking at ways to recruit new teachers and retain quality teachers as well. We invest in our staff and by offering them professional development that's personalized to their needs within their first several years of teaching and every year thereafter. The hope is that our staff feel comfortable and valued to do their very best when they're teaching. PD is offered to teachers at the district level and offered also at the building level to help them grow and develop themselves as individuals professionally through the advancements of degree certifications, participating in leadership development programs, mentoring, etc. Human Resources is able to also help those teachers capitalize on their personalized method of professional development and their professional growth. We also have the opportunity to have our staff apply for internal transfers as they see fit as well. And by expanding the definition of professional development to include mental health, support, and self-care, we know that the district can continue to take steps to identify and address the burnout that some of our staff may be feeling. We also support our employees through the employee assistance program that is available to every single employee in our district whether full-time or part-time, and it provides urgent assistance to employee health needs and helps develop a program of wellness for our employees at no cost to them. This fall, I met with our EAP representative to understand more of the benefits offered to our employees so that we are able to continue to embrace this resource and all of our employees and resources that they have for our districts across the resource, 
across the district. Melville Classified works, Workforce has a lot of diversity as well in their PD and their roles and responsibility. And these employees need and deserve professional development as well, specifically tailored to their skill sets and growth um, potential. And over the last several years, we've made efforts to provide professional development that is helpful for our employees on a peer-to-peer -peer setting. So for example, they're communicating with their co-workers. Co um, they are um, uh, working through the advancements to evaluate employees for a continuous improvement and cycle as well. Human Resources meets regularly with the classified leadership team to understand their overall needs as well and to try to enter, to basically help them promote um, and understand how their promotion can also be transferable to other positions within the classified staff. So the onboarding, what does that look like for our certified staff? With respect to onboarding, 72 new teachers were onboarded this August. In the new teacher training, we had a three-day event that was specifically designed to orientating them to the district, and it was holistic in that it provided information that was helpful to acquaint them in the ins and outs of our district. And with respect to ongoing, Melville should continue to rely on our standards that are outlined in DESE, and again, this supports our teaching staff with a two-year mentoring program, not just for teachers, but for administrators, where we're partnering them um, to have that support within the first two years. And in an effort to capture this experience of our new staff, we in our office are looking for ways to understand how they are doing within the first 30, 60, 90 days, with even in their first year or two years and beyond that, so that we can understand what additional supports our new staff may need. So for our classified staff, we have a 60-day probationary period set up for them where they are meeting regularly with their probationary or their supervisor, getting feedback on their performance for that 60-day performance as well. So employee engagement, gathering feedback from classified and certified staff allows the district to gauge current levels of employee motivation and engagement and isolate specific steps to increase this engagement. And currently, the district does use the Panorama tool as a, a measure of employee engagement. Um, and we're currently looking at that as a baseline to determine what um, we can do in terms of positively measuring well-being um, and targeting belonging and sense of voice and ensuring that all of these things are being appropriately measured through these surveys and that we're able to have um, a long range and a short range plan of targeted tasks, if you would, to ensure that our, our staff feel valued um, in our district. So the concept of having a workforce that reflects and represents our student population is important. We have identified three approaches to making sure that our district is inclusive, equitable, and diverse workplace. And first we look to increase this participation in community events um, with the diversity, culture, ethnicity, and language. And second, we build to um, a more class or more diversified workforce. And of course, to do this, we must convince potential employees to apply for district openings. And second, we must continually improve our hiring process to value diversity by refreshing our interview questions and our overall hiring process overall, like um, to, have, to have people see um, to want to come and work with us. And, and again, that's where you'll see the next steps. We're all recruiters. Um, every story that we tell, that's our Melville story. So we all have a story, a story of why, why we're here. And that's our Melville story. And it's unique, just like each one of our stories is unique. Each of our stories has a different reason to what landed and kept us in Melville, thus writing the My Melville Story. As we embark on the hiring season for certified staff and continue to recruit and retain classified staff, we ask that everyone share their My Melville story with others. Your story is a piece of our story, and each of our unique stories positively contributes to assisting in attracting, recruiting, and retaining individuals. Giving credit to Hunter Robinson, our multi-communications communication specialist, he began the My Melville Story series a few years back during his leadership development program for the district as an aspiring leader bringing awareness to the Melville staff, bringing awareness that a Melville staff um, does not necessarily reflect the diversity of the student population. Hunter knew the importance that, and he, that he must highlight and showcase the diversity we currently have within our schools to continue to attract and recruit a more diverse workforce. Over the course of the next several months, the district communications team will release the My Melville Story series. 
To give you a glimpse, here are two quotes from two of the 10 different stories that will be shared. We encourage you to share your story with at least one other person as we are all recruiters. In a My Melville story that will be released this spring, Ben McCluskey, music teacher at Beasley Elementary School, talks about what keeps him here. What keeps him here in Melville is the opportunities I've had, he said. I've had a really supportive staff. I've had a really supportive principal. I've had the opportunities to try new things, to meet new people outside my building, to get involved in different initiatives, and the kids. This year especially, I have felt like the joy that comes from witnessing the joy that kids experience, particularly when they're singing, and it comes through. Another My Melville story is Fatima Warren, counselor at Troutwine, was hired in Melville two years ago. Fatima speaks about her welcoming experience and what drew her to the district prior to even applying for her open position. Fatima shares in her words that Melville had the same core values that I had as far as educating students, and that's giving back, service, just having gratitude for what you have. Since I have been here, I have been welcomed. And this is our story. This is one of the many stories that all of us share, and we hope that we all continue to share our story. Any questions? Um, I do have a question, thank you. Um, as I was hearing you speak in regards to um, the mentorship program, mm -hmm. um, it, it made me wonder, like how structured is that program as far as what you make available to these mentors? And how do you then receive feedback from them? Um, is there something that's structured as far as the feedback that comes to you? Or is it individualized per school? So a lot of times between their mentor, they do have a checklist of items that they go through so that the mentor and the mentee go yes. through those items. But that feedback doesn't necessarily come to us. Okay. Um, but that is a structure that we are looking at, is okay. how is that mentorship how does it work? Um, and then um, do we feel like, are we getting that feedback from them to know if the mentee feels like that's beneficial for right. them um, to, to handle that, you oh. know, to, to grow from that? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Very informative. Thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. it. Next up is Community Survey Results, Jess Papillo. Good evening. Every two years, we go to our community and ask a series of questions, commissioning uh, for the past uh, five rounds, opinion research specialists to do this survey for us. Um, this year we did a mailed survey. In the past we've done phone surveys. Um, opinion research specialists recommended a mail survey for a variety of reasons. One being that they're getting a better response rate to that than the phone surveys. People are screening calls, younger demographic especially. It's tough to get through to them. Um, and also they're finding that people are more honest in a mail survey. Um, you don't have that person on the other end of the line that you may feel like you need to provide them the answer they want to hear. So this is our first year doing a mail survey. Um, survey was mailed to 5,000 randomly selected households with a frequent voter. Um, and we define frequent voter as someone who's voted in the last two April general municipal elections, one of those elections. Um, and one of those elections was actually in June due to COVID. Uh, we had at the over 1,100 surveys return with a 25% response rate. It's a bigger response rate than we've had um, on several surveys. And as a result, the margin of error is plus or minus 3%, whereas in the past it's been 5%. The survey was conducted throughout the month of November. Uh, surveys started reaching mailboxes on November 9th. They continued to receive them back through the end of the month. We also had companion surveys, um, online surveys that anyone could um, fill out. Those were targeted towards the general community and also to our parents. And you'll see some of those results also included, but predominantly we're looking at that um, frequent voter survey. Demographics of that, um, we had a, a bit more female respondents uh, this go around. The age skews older, as does um, frequent voters tend to be older, uh, with the mean age at 63. About a quarter of the respondents had children in the Melville School District. Um, 
and about a quarter of the respondents worked for Melville School District. Melville ZIP is defined as 63125 and 63123. Um, Oakville ZIP is defined as 63129. So you'll see the, the demographics broken out throughout the full report. I'm highlighting a few in this presentation. Um, in addition to satisfaction ratings, this year we asked um, for opinions associated with four proposals from the district and um, specific to a tax levy increase. So those four proposals, um, the first proposal involved asking how favorable or how much people would support increasing teacher salaries to become competitive in the region and to attract and retain high quality teachers. 85% of respondents favored that proposal um, between strongly favor and somewhat favor. The second proposal was increasing salaries for bus drivers, custodians, cooks, nurses, and other support staff to attract and retain these essential workers. We had 87% favoring that proposal. Um, the third proposal was retaining interventionist teachers hired using federal COVID-19 relief funds set to expire um, at the end of the 23-24 school year. And on that um, proposal, 74% of respondents um, favored that. And then finally, support services. Continuing to provide other support services provided by COVID-19 relief funds set to expire 23-24 school year, including after-school clubs, after-school <coughs> tutoring, and mental health counseling support. Um, and the respondents, 73%, were supportive of that. And then we asked them what sort of tax um, rate increase they would support. This is a little bit of a tricky diagram um, to look at, so let me break that down a little bit. 30% um, of respondents would oppose a tax levy increase. 17% um, um, indicated they would support a levy increase of 49 cents. 51, sorry, let me, yep. I'm getting myself confused by this chart. 51% would support at least a 30 cent tax levy increase um, and 70% would support a 17 cent tax rate increase. Um, of the no responses, we could kind of look at, at why they weren't supportive of that, and it kind of falls into two buckets, one being economic concerns, um, family budget concerns, inflation concerns, the same concerns we all have. Um, and the other bucket would be unhappiness with district, not understanding kind of what we do, um, and general concerns with the district. But as you can see here, we've got quite a number of respondents that would support some level of um, tax rate increase. And then we can break that down by demographic. Um, not surprising, parents, those with children in Melville School District, um, our younger residents, those who work for Melville School District, are more likely to support uh, a tax levy increase at a higher amount than um, older members of our population and those that don't have kids in our district. Then we broke this down and compared it to the online survey results. So the first column is the frequent voter results that we just shared and that's just the percent of strongly favoring. The second column is those that responded to the parent online survey, and then the third column is those that responded to the general public survey. So the parent survey, again, so shows a stronger favorability for our four proposals, um, as does the general public response, but those general public respondents are somehow tied to the school district. They're following us on social media, they're subscribed to our email newsletter, um, they're reading Melville Mes Messenger enough to start looking for that survey to come out. So uh, they're pretty motivated and engaged with us. When we look at combining both strongly and somewhat favor, we see that the same trends emerge, uh, but just at higher levels since it's somewhat and strongly together. And then when we look at the tax rate level increases, um, again, we see the same trends with stronger support with parents and then stronger support with general public that are tied to us in some fashion. Then we go on to our satisfaction questions, which we've been asking um, for several years, starting in 2000 and, um, 2014. And those have sort of taken a dip um, this year from the highs that we saw in 2020. I wouldn't be surprised if many school districts um, saw dips like this coming out of the pandemic. 
Um, the first question is uh, how satisfied residents are with us spending tax dollars, tax dollars wisely, 76%. We're satisfied in the general public poll and in the parent poll, um, those results were higher. Providing a safe and secure environment for students, 87% um, of respondents were satisfied. That's down significantly from the past. And this survey also came right on the heels of the St. Louis Public School shooting. It also came on the heels of several lockdowns in our schools. Um, so it could be why, why we saw that dip there. Planning for the future needs of our district is also down, but 79% of respondents are satisfied with our long-range planning efforts. Uh, we saw that dip a little bit in our general public poll, and it is higher in the parent survey. Keeping the public informed, if you're noticing a trend here, is down um, slightly as well. 78% of respondents were satisfied uh, with keeping the public informed. And we have a breakdown of how people are getting their information on one of the Final slides. Preparing students for success in college and work, 76% of respondents were satisfied with our ability to prepare students for college or the workforce. And then setting high expectations for academic performance, 73% of respondents were satisfied with our expectations of student academic performance. Again, down um, from previous highs that we saw. Resolving critical issues facing the district, 72% of respondents were satisfied um, with that. General public was down from that 72% and the parent poll again was higher. Overall satisfaction, 79% of respondents were satisfied with Melville School District, which is down um, again from 2020 levels and 2018 levels. Um, and the general public poll, 75% were satisfied in the parent poll, 82%. Uh, we're satisfied. So it will be interesting to follow these trends um, again when we survey in 2024 uh, and see where, where we're at. Um, I mentioned information sources. Melville Messenger remains a top way that we are um, communicating with our frequent voters in the community, um, as is the call newspaper. And of course, word of mouth word travels fast in our community um, amongst neighbors and friends. Uh, district emails, that is growing, um, and it's strong amongst parents, um, as is social media and website. That is all I have on the community survey. Happy to try to answer any questions that weren't shared in the board notes. I have one question. Okay. Just, do you recall? Oh, your microphone. Your microphone on. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had it on. Um, do you recall what month in 2020 did we send out that survey? That was done in November as well. Was it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And it was a telephone survey. That was a telephone survey. And then also on eBoards, because of one of our questions, there are links to the 2020, 2018, 2016, and 2014 surveys for everybody to look at for comparison reasons. Um, one question out of curiosity that I did have is, on district emails, do we actually have email addresses for the community? How do we get those? Yeah, around 2018, we started uh, providing community members with sign-up forms on our website so they can sign up to follow board notes, um, get alerts when board meetings are coming up and get the board notes after. They can sign up for eMessenger, which is general um, every other week updates about the district. They can sign up for employment alerts and they can sign up for community enrichment. So we have four email products. We also take email addresses we've collected from different events and we've merged them all into one document now. So we have over 20,000 email addresses on file. Wow. Parents plus community members, our 60 plus club members, those of you who have used community enrichment in the past. Great, thank you. I've got a Scott. question. Yeah. So, uh, my apologies. Admittedly, when I went through this prior to the board meeting, I was mainly interested in the tax levy information. I'm, I'm surprised at how uh, this year versus previous years in terms of community satisfaction with the district has fallen off in nearly every category. Um, that's really surprising to me given the fact that I feel like our marketing and communications team has done wonderful work in terms of informing the, uh, our, our populace about all the great things that's go that are going on here. 
Um, here's a question. Is there any thought that because this was um, an online versus a phone um, survey, uh, are people maybe more willing to be, I don't know, harsh or like, you know, through something online versus if you're talking to somebody? Is there any, is there any data related to that? There is science behind that. When you have a person talking one-on-one -on -one with someone in person, we know that there's bias towards telling them what they think you want to hear, right? So if I'm asking you a question, you may respond to me saying what you think I want to hear. The same holds true with a phone survey, which is what we had done in the past. This one was predominantly male survey. We didn't have that many returned online. People could go to a link and fill out the survey online and submit it, but predominantly they responded using the, um, the stamped envelope that was provided. Uh, so yeah, there is science behind that. Okay, and then, so for the other years, 18, 16, 14, were those all phone all as phone. well? All mm phone. -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. That was a lot of information. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we appreciate it because it helps us guide our decisions. Next up is Prop S update, Dr. DeKemper. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. I'm happy to report that there has been a tremendous amount of energy in our construction site since we last met and that the pace of work being accomplished has increased. We'll see evidence of that tonight. Um, we previously shared our green check marks for the Prop S work that has been completed. While we have not added any green checks yet, be prepared for that to happen soon. If you look at this work taking place in the schools, Beerbaum Elementary represents probably our most visually striking progress. Uh, to drive by is impressive. Brick work began taking place last week. Temporary windows are in, roofing is nearly complete, and they start drywalling on the inside of the addition this week. To walk through it is to really see a framed structure and what it represents for the school. Blades Elementary is also coming along nicely. You see two representations here. Those were taken earlier this week. Some of the work on the inside of the school is close to being done, and the entrance is making great progress as well. Um, so you'll see evidence of tile and ceiling work. Some of the cabinetry, uh, the remote terminal units, and HVAC should be arriving in January. And with that, we expect to begin phases of occupancy early in 2023, and that would include the art room, the nurse's office, uh, the teacher's lounge, and we'll get folks in as quickly as we can as that work is completed. Our punch list take place. There's been a tremendous amount of effort around bid package four, which includes OES, Bernard, and Rogers. And to look at Bernard from where it was a month ago, we have the storefront and the glass installed, painting is done, the electrician started earlier this week. They were back at 6.45 this morning. Um, so that work should be done soon. We conducted our punch list, and anytime you do a punch list, you find things that you really want done to satisfaction. So now it's a matter of quality on some issues before we sign off on the projects. And with that, we expect the fire alarm testing to take place on the 19th. Oakville Elementary is probably a bid package for the school that is closest to being added to that list of green check marks. So there's been a tremendous amount of work being done. I believe the electrical work was finished. Um, we, were, we were trying out the doors and the locks when we were there. Um, the fire alarm testing again takes place on 1219. We are holding them off because they're so eager to get into the office. Um, but as soon as that fire alarm inspection takes place and our punch list item that was identified is completed, they'll be able to get there. And at Rogers Elementary, you have a chance to go down and look at that. They've already decorated. Uh, the framing is complete. The ramp and the store stairway work is completed. Um, Dr. Kinoy is standing there. The proud principal greeting students. That fire alarm testing should take place on the 19th. There is some sod work that we, we anticipate will be completed in the spring. However, they're saying they may be able to get it done. We're watching temperatures to see if that actually happens that quickly or not. 
And what's next? Um, if it were light outside, you would be able to see the scale of work being done in our ball fields. And we have continued to engage stakeholder voice in our design process. So when it comes to beer bomb phase two, we're including librarian representatives of the school. We're asking for their opinion and our planning process. We're going, I'm joining Dr. Gaines as he visits each school and really just prepares the schools that are next um, in line for disruption and some of the challenges that might be faced. We've also shared the experience of some principals with others um, so that they can prepare their staffs from a principal lens. So there's a lot taking place and there's a lot we're doing to prepare for that. Um, our upcoming bids have not changed, so we remain on track to do Beer Bomb Phase 2 in January and some of the other schools listed there as well throughout July. And then thank you to Marshall and his team for updating our finances. With that, I'll answer any questions that you have. It's good to see we're making progress that's both visual and, and helpful because it's a good way to point at something and say, look, this is what we're doing. This is where we're at. So it makes the community a little more understanding of, you know, this has been slow, but some of this has obviously been well outside of control and other things just happen because they happen the way they did. So it's good that we're making visual progress and it's good that we're making progress to actually put some of these down and check them off. Scott? So the, uh, with the upcoming bids, the largest bid that we're going to have is beer bomb phase two, is that right? Yes, sir. So how, how soon do we need to approve that for the work to be completed by when we would want it to be completed by? Oh, I see. It's going out for bid in January. Okay. Um, all right. The only reason I ask is because I know that's the most expensive one we've got left. And then we've got these other pieces that are less expensive. So deciding on the most expensive thing first might, if we, if we approve something, it might I just want to make sure we've got enough money for the other projects that are behind it, that are smaller dollar figure. So is there any way to, I mean, this, this is the schedule. We can't rearrange that at all. Is that right? We feel like this addresses beer bomb, which is our big rock. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Anybody else? And thank you very much. Or I'm pretty excited seeing the progress. Future ballot issue, Dr. Gaines. All right, good evening. Okay, so uh, as it was stated earlier, you know, we've kind of been asking this question of what kind of school district does the community want? And, you know, especially thinking out well into the future. And We've had a number of discussion around uh, a possible future ballot issue. We've talked about what our current year assessed value is and what that generates in terms of revenue uh, for a penny of tax rate. You've seen the relative costs of these ESSER items for quite some time. The salary pieces had been uh, a little bit um, undetermined a little bit. We have on eBoard uh, a salary comparison report that's um, quite lengthy that answers that and I'll layer those in a little bit later. Um, at our last time we kind of drilled in on uh, what I thought were probably more appropriate dates to be thinking about uh, the possibility of these items as well as kind of reminding the decision deadlines to hit um, different election dates, as well as we've talked about and mentioned and shown um, what different uh, rates of, uh, what different amounts of any and that impact on folks' tax bill. We've also talked about, um, you know, when kind of to do things, what those options are, um, and, you know, 
kind of the windows for some of these things, as well as kind of the more detailed cost, if you think about um, an a la carte approach to um, decision making and what things to fund. We've shared the ballot language from Prop, Prop R, just an example of what that looks like, as well as what ballot language looks like just from a net, from a larger generic standpoint. And then we kind of wrapped up last time with questions around to think about what do we include on a ballot measure, you know, how, how that looks, is it two different ballots, is it one, do we include some operational safety items, when, when do we ask, and those things. So going back to this idea of having things to consider and when to go and the possibilities of when uh, things could be asked over the next um, couple of years. So we, I want to drill down on the capital side of that uh, kind of first. We talked with uh, our financial advisors and bonding company to give some estimates. So these are the numbers as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as we get closer to these dates, these numbers will change. You know, they're going to they're fluctuate a little bit. So thinking about just a bond, if we were to go out for a bond um, in April of 24 uh, and just using the existing 12 cents, uh, we could do something, you know, around, you know, under 13 million. If we waited a year, um, still keeping with that same 12 cents, we could take that up to just over 14. However, if we took the four cents from Prop A and rolled that into a bond, that brings those numbers up. So um, basically it doubles them, right? Each of those numbers. So we're looking at, you look at possibility of doing more like 25 or 28. We also asked, what if we went big? And what would that generate? or what, what would it take? So we asked, what if we did a 100 million bond? In the lead up to Prop S, we identified over $200 million in projects. Prop S is 35 million, so we've got a lot left to do. Um, so depending on which year we would go, it's gonna be somewhere around 40 cents in the next couple of years to go at 100 million. Um, just using that kind of as a, as a basis for planning and thinking. So if you look at then options on the lower half here, the lower portion of this, it's what, what are our options? So we could go, if we ended Prop A and shifted that into a bond, we could go for 25 and a half, or that same time we could just go for uh, almost 13, staying with the 12 cents, or we could go big and it would, we would need to add another 40 cents for 100 million. And then you can see the similar numbers if we waited a year to do that. So after kind of laying kind of all of that around, um, where my thinking is as of today, um, and this could evolve, is think about roughly that $14 million bond in 2025, um, doing that within the existing 12 cents. As you know, we've eliminated some projects from Prop S, so those would be kind of first priority um, as we think about a new bond and then other minor projects, because uh, really 14 is not gonna get us a lot, uh, and we have a lot that's out there. Then think about a larger bond somewhere out there, or, you know, in 2029 or 2030, Hundred million doesn't have to be that number, but something of significance to really make a dent. And then really going back and forth, uh, taking a look at uh, probably the best option is to extend Prop A in 2026 and extend that as a capital levy. Currently, I mean, that's what it is specifically for roofs and HVAC, keeping that same piece, but kind of knocking out that notion of a um, having a sunset date, if you will. Uh, because if you look at 
what that four cents generates, and you think about 2025, if we pulled it into a bond issue in 2025, we could take the bond up to roughly 28. Well, Prop A, over 20 years, that four cents would generate about 14 million. So that would be 14 million in roofs and HVAC work that we could do over that time for which we would be paying no interest versus we would in a bond. So that's kind of the reasoning for laying it out like that. So if we look at those capital possibilities kind of all together, right? We did that April 21, that was Prop S, we moved 12 cents, that was 35 million. Thinking about keeping using that same 12 cents to do about 14, maybe hopefully a little bit more in 2025, coming back in 26, extending that Prop A. Today that generates about 700,000, that, you know, that's gonna fluctuate. And then something large in, uh, you know, 29 or 30, which is probably going to cost 30 cents or more uh, if we're still in that hundred million dollar range. So again, going back to the notion of what kind of school district does the community want? And every time we go to the ballot, the community makes the decision. And based on the community's decision at that point, we, re we recalculate and reimagine what's possible. So then as, if we go back to that notion of a la carte with ESSER and we add in the salary pieces, um, we can see that if we just do kind of the pure calculation, we come in at about 38 cents. And that is especially noting anything salary related, whether that's the interventionist or trying to get to a competitive salary, those are costs in the current year. So therefore we put in an escalator um, and then for each of those then we round it up to what that was in terms of pennies for that particular item instead of having all of these strange uh, fact fractions. So really we'll, you know, if you look at everything in total, it's roughly in that 50 cent range uh, to do all of those items. So if we think about each of those and layer in uh, historical information, um, when we went to voters with Prop S, we had done a survey beforehand. That survey showed about, you know, 67% of our population was favorable for doing that. The voter results were 80% uh, approval. For Prop R, um, we had asked questions at different amounts. So uh, at 45 and 55, we went in the middle at 49. That's what we asked and we got 72. So what we can tell from these two examples and data sets is that when we enter with a favorability rating of over 50%, our advocacy efforts by advocacy committees, then even bring that up a little bit more, at least in those two examples, which are the most recent. So then if we look at the four broad areas for which we had asked, and uh, Jessica Pillow presented these earlier, but to just layer them in here, we had uh, high favorability rates, well over 50% on all four items. So then if you kind of then layer all of that in with that a la carte piece, uh, that I've shown and kind of break them into kind of some groupings and having certified and classified salaries with those favorability ratings, all of the interventionists asked together with that favorability rating and cost and then the after school supports. And then we have some items that we didn't ask about, right? They're, they're smaller items. Uh, they're not as significant uh, as items and probably things that, you know, a layperson wouldn't necessarily know that we were kind of doing those things. So when we look at the ESSER pieces, um, we went back to our administrators and asked them within elementary, middle, and high school, kind of rank those ESSER pieces in really where they believe they find the most value. So for elementary, the interventionist data supports and after school supports ranked high. For middle school, the interventionist, the after school, and the data supports ranked high. 
And for the high school, it was Chad's, the interventionist, and the after school supports were ranking the highest. All right? So then if we pull, pull those in, what we see are the, that the top ESSER items to maintain then are the interventionists, the after school, and Chad's, and the data supports. So really, it was the data supports that were the only thing that we didn't ask about, and that's a relatively um, small amount. So if we then layer in with that the, the salary pieces, um, then we can begin to see what those calculations are along with those favorability ratings. So if you look at all of that kind of overall, then the needs would tend to be about 26 or 27 cents for salaries. About 13 cents would fund the interventionists, six to seven cents for the after school supports and about a penny for the data. So somewhere between, you know, that 46 to 48 range, which again is very close to the 50 or so that was mentioned earlier. Jessica also noted from the survey where the level of supports were at different levy amounts um, on the survey. So if we layer that in with the other information, if we look at salaries, salaries is a cost of about 27 cents. Favorability was over 80. The levy favorability because the salaries is between 17 and 30, and we had 70% at 17 and 30, uh, and 51% at 30 cents. We layered it, that levy favorability is probably in there somewhere. The ESSER interventionists being the lower amount at a lower amount at 13 cents with 74% favorability. And because that levy is under 17 cents, um, a high favorability on the, le the levy side. And then the other pieces, you can see those um, numbers there. So coming back to this notion of board decisions and what options kind of lay out and taking this and layering in this new information, um, then it, we layer the bond pieces or the capital pieces I had talked about. And then so we're looking at 27 and 21 cents to fund um, those ESSER items in an ongoing way, right? So we come back to the notion of when to ask, right? So for salaries, we get to ask as soon as April. If we don't do that in April, it's just gonna be more pennies the further down the road we go. For the levy, for the ESSER pieces, you know, that's a little, it's around 21 cents today. That will grow over time, but it's not gonna grow like the salaries will. The ESSER piece has a small salary. So again, the same kinds of questions, do we put them together on the same ballot, one ballot language for both of them? Do we separate and ask for levies and salary, or sorry, ESSER and salaries as separate items? Do we ask and put both on the same ballot? Do we ask for them separately and at different times? Do we ask them for them at the same time? but phase in. So do part of the levy one year and part of the levy the next year, but phase that in. Do we include operational safety items in there? Um, just because that seems to be popular. Does that help garner support? So going back to the ballot language, what we've got to fill in is for the purposes of blank and fund it by increasing it to what amount. Right, and then that gives us the estimated amount. So in order to get something on the April 4 ballot, the decision has to be made by January 24th. We have a meeting scheduled on January 19th, so that meeting is sufficient to fulfill that deadline and for us to get it to the county. Don't wanna go in April, wanna look at November, August 29 is the deadline, right? Doesn't have to be that decision doesn't have to be made in August. That's just the latest that it could be made, right? And for what amount and for what purposes. So again, if we look at it visually, when to ask 
or 27 cents. If you want to ask for 27 cents, higher amount, a lower amount. For the ESSER funded positions, when to ask at that amount, at a higher amount, together, separately, which way is it going to be? Again, going, here's kind of the a la carte piece to take a look at, and then it really becomes for the next three election possibility dates, what, if anything, do you want to ask for, and when do you want to ask for it? So with that, I will attempt to answer any questions that you might have. And if you ask me questions that are just too big of a guess and we don't know, we do have a magic eight ball tonight. <laughs> That's good. I have, I have a question. Can you remind us if, in, if something was, when something is placed on the ballot, if in fact it passes, what's, how long before that money is um, able to be utilized? Like when does that come? How, <clears throat> what's the last So time? since we have the April and the November ballots on, that, that's the easiest to tell, right? So if we went in April of 23, then the levy, and it passed, then when the board set the tax rate in September of 23, it would be on tax bills that come that fall. And so we would see the first revenue in December of 23, right? Then we would see more in January. That, that's pretty much where that would come. So if we pass something in April, we would have the money for f next school year. If you wait until November, you set in November, you're not going to set the tax rate until 10 months later the following September. So it's going to be the year after. So for most, it, the easiest thing to think about is if, it, if you're asking in April, it's going to be the next school year. If you're asking in November, it's going to be the next school year. If you ask in August, which we eliminated those dates just in these to see this, if you ask in August and it passes, you're setting the tax rate a month later and it can be the same year. So August is kind of the anomaly in that respect. Hopefully that made sense. Okay. All right, so, all right, so let me try to explain it this way. Okay. April is at the end of one school year, right. which enables, with a passage, to get revenue the next school year. So, so if it were April 23, revenue for 23 to 24, or yes, okay. Got it. But November would be passed when we set the tax. tax, tax yes. Tax. The tax rate, okay. the, we have to set the tax rate in September, and that is the hinge yeah. that everything acts on. Okay. So if you get it before September, yes. then you can get the tax revenue that okay. fall. Okay. If it's after that September, you've got to wait another year. Okay. That makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, I guess you get, need to get it before you approve the budget, though, too, right? Is that? Budget approval is statutory required by June 30th. Okay. I'm sorry, I've got a, one other question. So the one document that you shared, and I'm, I'm sure I missed something here, said that we needed 22 cents for competitive salaries, but the, the one that you've got here said 27 cents. So mm -hmm. what's the nickel difference? Oh, probably could have had it earlier than that. So you can see the pure tax rate calculation is the number in the document. And for the purposes of this conversation, well, let me go back to the document. We need that amount of salary this year to be competitive. So that's what our tax rate needs to be this year. So in thinking about next year, we included an escalator for that 
And then after we escalated each one of those, then we rounded it up to the nearest cent, right? Because you need 13.26 cents to do that. 13 is not enough. So you round to 14 because you're going to ask for whole cents. Gotcha. And the escalator total was based off of cost of living or inflation rate, or what were those escalators based off of? It, well, to some extent, it's an inflationary rate of, based on the tax rate, not on the cost. Okay. So in theory, the 27 cents should better ensure that we're competitive for the next at least couple years into the future. Correct. Okay. And the 20, another rationale around the escalation is not only do you have to catch up, then you have to sustain it, right? So the 27 makes it a little bit more comfortable to sustain it. But as you say, we don't know how long that will remain competitive, largely because we don't know what anybody else is going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, I mean, they're already competitive. We're not. <laughs> so in theory, we'll, we'll, you know, hopefully we're the only ones that are looking at that sort of raise because everybody else is really competitive. Uh, Dr. Gaines, what was the, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't, can't see the one. I hope I could get these on in hard copy to really study. But um, what did you say the, the cents were on the ESSER funding only for that? 13 cents? Is that what you said? I was trying to write it down as I heard it, but I... So the interventionist is 13. 13, okay. The after school supports is about seven, and then the data supports is about a penny for a total of 21 for the lesser pieces. Okay. Which, if you go back to the a la carte, what we ended up eliminating in that was. Um, the supplies piece and the uh, kindergarten program and the additional ACS. Okay, and finally, uh, of the $200 million worth of facility um, uh, improvements that we need to make, and we're currently at 37, I mean, that we, you know, we, we had 37 to work with this time around. What would the cent amount be to be able to cover even half of those other facility improvements that we need to take care of? Well, you know, just ballparking, if you think that we would need, um, so 35 off the, the 200 ish, and it, it was more than 200. Yeah. So you're still at 165 million, right? So you need another 65. So, yeah. you know, you're looking at, 65, you're, the rough back in the napkin math is then going to be 65% of roughly 40 cents. So, what, you're looking at 25, you know, around another quarter. So, probably something 65, 70 cents to, to go really big. Right, right. right. Well, but, you know, if you think about St. Louis County, you think about tax rates, right? We always show that ours is low. Part of that is a debt levy. Our debt levy is really low compared yeah. to everybody else. Yes, it is. And we know that just a few weeks, you know, just a little over a month ago, with no change in their tax rate, Parkway passed 260 something million dollars to improve their facilities. So once you have that rate in place, then your ability to draw from that and continue to invest in facilities is really significant. But like so many other things, we're playing catch up. Yep. So this might be a good time to remind us and the community how long it had been since we passed any tax levies, 28, 30 years. So 92 was the last bond issue. 2000 was the lease, um, and then, yeah, Prop R was the increase that restored a lot of the cuts that had been made over the years leading up to that, but not all of those. Um, 
and then it had been a while before that for anything had passed. So, um, but I, I, I think though, at, at least my perception was that there's been this historical perception that the community doesn't support salaries. And I think this survey may have set that on its head to go, it, I, I mean, certainly the labor market is tighter now than it has been, and there's been more media around that. And certainly, you know, we've got signs all over the place about how we're trying to hire, you know, and, and we have a, a lot of openings. Uh, but I think that high rate of favorability for competitiveness in salaries and to recruit and retain, I, I think that was a little higher than what we were anticipating. So if we don't go in April 23, and we wait until August or September, or August of, or November, and I understand that then we don't get the funding until the next school year, can we, knowing that the money comes, automatically give our staff those raises, or does it have to wait until the next year? So, if, a levy passes, if we, if we put something on the ballot in April for salaries, and if it passed, we will not realize any revenue from that until November, or sorry, December. That's when we'll get our first tax check. So yes, we could give salary increases for next year. However, this is why we need healthy balances because we will be spending at a higher rate for the first half of the fiscal year. So having the money in the bank to be able to do that then is important so that we wouldn't have to do short-term borrowing for that. So in the end, if we passed in April, yes, we would want to raise salaries for next school year. Okay, but so, but to clarify, so August or November, we absolutely could not raise no. salaries and use some of our reserves. We would no. have to wait till the next school year. Yes. No matter what. August is tricky because we would have, if we waited until August, we would have to adopt a budget with no big raises without running a crazy risk. And then, the ballot would be in early August, and there is the slight then potential that for most of, for many of our employees, they would not have started their contracts yet, and those salaries could be raised. And then theoretically, we couldn't negotiate on any contracts until, if we decided to go in April, we would obviously wait until after that to, to finish negotiations on contracts. For, on staffing contracts? Yeah, but, you know, I mentioned a finance committee meeting, just a few people. I don't even know if I'd start until after we knew. After but, the, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So not, don't do any, oops, sorry, yeah. any negotiating. Okay. Uh, one more question. I'm sorry. Is operational safety, um, is that number even included in the salary proposal? So that would be a whole nother... Do we have any idea how many cents that would take, or I don't even well, know. Well, I mean, we know a penny at. generates around two hundred twenty thousand. So, depending on what we wanted to do, um, it's not that. That's not too difficult of a calculation to be to, able to layer that in to there to add more security in our buildings. Well, through people. Yeah, I mean, part of that, you know, you know, if we wanted to have a standalone uh, safety coordinator, or if we wanted to accelerate. Um, our camera rollout in our elementary schools. Okay. I know with the answer piece, obviously we're funded until the end of 23-24. Correct. But obviously, if staff is assuming that if it's not funded, then their positions will most likely be eliminated, we can step that out just because the funding is there until 23-24 ends. But I think from a stability standpoint, it would be better to have that piece in place, would it not? For the funding for the ESSER positions. Well, that's why I kind of talked 
or kind of ask around the phase in. So if you, sorry, I don't, sure. Right. I want to try to get to here. So if you think about the 27 cents for salaries, we would want that for fiscal year 24. So the 23-24 school year in order to raise salaries. If you think about the ESSER, the ESSER is completely funded through FY24. We don't need that until FY25. Hence the notion of perhaps the, the phased in idea of you ask for it all at once, but you don't tax it all at once. Tax the salary piece for FY24 and you tax begin the tax on the ESSER piece for FY25 and beyond. Uh, if you wanted to put them together on the same ballot in basically April or August. Um, so from, way, a, from a functional standpoint, if you split them up and say you did the ESSER piece in April 24, you could also do it in April of 23, but have ballot language that says it won't take effect until the year later after it's voted in. Potentially, yes. But the downside of that is, of course, if you essentially look like you're asking for 49 cents, and obviously the public has said that seems to be a little high, then it might be better from a perception standpoint to possibly split them out rather than phasing them in because they'll read the ballot as a 49 cent piece and say no, even when it's not really because it steps in a year later. I, I question. go to the old notion of, um, you know, in scout training, we often tell people to keep it simple. So as the more complicated you get it, or the more complex, it just gets harder for people to understand. So. Um, I think as a general rule, probably the more straightforward we can be, probably might be the better. It's, it's certainly simpler, I think, for any advocacy group to advocate for um, if things are pretty simple. So in that case, siloing them in separate years would make sense in that respect? That would seem to be simpler. Rather than trying to do any level of phase in or anything. Those are just options, right? And that's kind of what the board has to decide. Which, which option do we want, right? How many pennies do we want to ask for, if any? For what do we want to use that, those pennies? When do we want to ask, and how do we want that question to be asked? So what we will do if, you know, the feeling is that April is a possibility is we'll bring op a number of options of ballot language for you for January. I, I think I'm in favor of siloing these and not asking for S or N salaries in the same year, but if we wanted to ask for salaries and, and uh, interventionists and all the S or uh, programs in April, and if it passed, ESSER, all of the interventionists and all of the ESSER funded programs are already funded for next year. So what would that extra revenue go towards for this next budget? <laughs> uh, it would more than likely go to a question that you asked earlier when Dr. DeKemper was up here. And that is that we could probably shift all of that ESSER money that's slated to be spent in FY24 to capital and be able to offset some Prop S expenses. Now we have to get DESE approval for that, but we've not had any issue getting approvals on especially HVAC related things and knowing what other districts have been, have gotten approved, I, I, that's probably the easiest piece that fits within the ESSER and it helps the prop S piece is to shift that to capital. I mean, we already did that with some of the ESSER funding anyway, so yes. there's already a, a road that we've gone down on that, so it should be an easy change in that respect if that happens and everything falls into place. 
that does keep it away from keeping things simple <laughs> for the general yes. public to understand, I think. Because we're asking for, as, the, the, in theory, the language would be for uh, keeping salaries competitive and for ESSER-related activities. Well, I mean, we can't even do that this year because ESSER's already paid for, you know? So, I, I don't know. It's just a thought. I mean, the other thing, I mean, if you... Well, the alternative would be going back again next year and asking for right. it. Right. Yeah, no, and I think that's the best solution. But, I mean, I know everybody's got different... You do think so? I do. I think it keeps it, I think it, keeps it simpler, and I'd rather hedge our bets on making sure that we're getting our salaries competitive. I'd like to fix that problem. That's been a systemic problem we've had for years. And I think if we can hedge our bets and make sure that we address that and we have the best opportunity of having it passed, I, I would like, I mean, I think that's a very valid way to consider this. Wait, am I, I may be misunderstanding you. I'm thinking one and done. I'm thinking one, one this April, one next April. That, that was what okay. part of the discussion at the finance meeting was right. yesterday. I mean, I think that, the, you know, we, we looked at past for Prop R and Prop S and knowing that we polled at a percentage and the community came in at a higher support percentage, I could believe that probably will fall through in this, which means 17 cents, that's probably not an issue, but obviously that doesn't get us where we need to be. 30 cents is probably a safe assumption knowing that we polled at 51% support on that and it's likely to go higher. When you start going at the 40% mark, do I think the polling would skew so that actually would pass? Maybe. So if we try and keep it under the perceptional points that the public has said we're good with, siloing it makes sense across two different years. And it also simplifies it as we've said. Well, that's going to take a lot of discussion and thought. Oh, yes. So I guess we'll leave it there for now. We have plenty of ballot language we can kick around. Right. Uh, so while we're here, Gene brings that up, discussion to be had. Um, are we going to do that tonight, or do we want to do that in January? Because, like, we obviously, it doesn't sound like we're voting on anything tonight because we still have the January board meeting. So that's the one we'll come lock in, locked and loaded for? So Because we need ballot language. So okay. what, what you would be voting on is the ballot length. We really don't need anything up until that point. really don't need any action up until that point. But it will take board action to do the ballot length. So um, as I mentioned, what we will prepare multiple options for ballot language um, to review, to take a look okay. at and select which one. So and we've already started working with our attorneys on that. So all right, so I've just, my interpretation of how I thought this was going to go was we would not decide tonight, but then if I know that there's going to be, I don't know, I'm throwing out a number, like three or four proposals at the next one, and then we'll vote for which one we want to move forward, right? Yep. All right, cool. We'll narrow, down, narrow it down to one motion, I would imagine. And then we vote yes or no on that motion, okay. And so I think if you don't mind, Dr. Gaines, if you could share this presentation with everybody um, tomorrow. I think that will help yes. everybody have that in front of you. I, I mean, personally, I have started a, a Google folder with all of the information he's provided us through the last few months, so I can share that with everybody if you want me to, um, all of his presentations so far. Yes, so it's, please. it's nice to be able to open up that folder and see it all in front of you and refer back, because most of these questions we're asking him have been answered in previous um, presentations, but I know it's hard to keep track of. So, anybody else? The one thing I will add is we did have finance committee, like you guys all mentioned, and finance committee reviewed everything, the surveys and the, um, the salary comparisons, and they agreed that we did not have budget for, to bring um, our employees up to where this, where we should be and that we should, they uh, reinforce that we should be going and asking the voter to decide what they want to see out of their own district. So, anybody else? All right, that's it, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is advocacy priorities. Is that you, Jeff? I guess it will be me. All right. Now, in the charter for the advocacy committee, there's a deliverable that's required by November 30th 
to be presented at this meeting about the advocacy priorities for the upcoming legislative session, which starts in early January. This is a document that has gone through multiple different revisions from last year to this year and will obviously continue to proceed. It, at a high level, was basically starts at items that the advocacy priorities for the district should, for the board should be, broken up in the categories of legislative mandates, school safety and security, open enrollment, health care, pre-K, internet access, and then we added one at the end in recent discussion for English, English language learners because obviously our district has a significantly high EL requirement for all the languages we have that are not English and all the students that need assistance with that. So this basically establishes our positions, either opposes or supports on those items. And they were on e-boards. If you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody have anything? All right. Um, if I could please get a motion to approve the advocacy priorities as presented. So, so moved. moved. Oh, sorry. Do you? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Okay, next up is the COVID-19 resolution. Dr. Gaines again, I guess. Yes. So if we go back in time, we had set meetings through the holidays um, to meet that kind of uh, requirement around re-upping the resolution every 21 days. Um, and that was kind of all that we scheduled was through the first semester so that we could see. So I'm going to share some uh, data with you uh, tonight on uh, COVID, RSV, and flu and kind of what, what we're experiencing. So this is um, countywide data from, from the health department. We, uh, all of this, other than our internal data, this all came from uh, a meeting we had with, uh, say we regional superintendents had with Dr. Rachel Orslin from uh, Wash, Wash U and St. Louis Children's Hospital. She's been someone who's consulted with districts all throughout, uh, all throughout the pandemic. So the yellow represents what's happening, uh, been happening with COVID in the, in the county. Uh, you can see that green was what we experienced last year with that big spike um, in um, right after the new, right after the holidays, um, essentially. But um, overall, much lo um, much lower than where we were two years ago, um, and lower than where we were a year ago. We look at what's been happening with hospitalization data that's certainly been kind of maintaining itself at a much lower level than where we were um, you know, 11 months ago or so. And if we look at COVID deaths across the U.S., um, we can see much lower than where we were in November, the two prior Novembers or December, this, this time of the year. If we look at RSV, that's the yellow line. Uh, other years are the other colored lines. You see that we certainly had that big spike at the end of September, first part of October. Um, our attendance showed that um, in terms of what we could see. We had a pretty good drop. We had a little bit of a bump back up um, here at the first part of December. But flu has been like off the charts almost. Uh, when you look at what flu has done um, compared to prior years. It is earlier and it is more intense, right? We've got more folks. Uh, so between RSV and the flu, um, we have seen the result through both uh, employee and student attendance um, dealing with those. So, if we again kind of looking at in the flu, 
this is kind of, you know, breaks the year up into the numbered weeks of the year. Um, we can just see that in the flu cycle, we're earlier overall. Um, I don't have it in here, uh, but one of the things that Dr. Orselin did share is when, it, when they're trying to predict flu in the Northern Hemisphere, they look at what happened in the Southern Hemisphere. And so she shared data from uh, Australia and their experience with the flu over their winter, which is our summer. Uh, and it went up fast and stayed high for a bit. And then it came down fast. However, that whole time span was still 90 to 120 days. So it was, you know, the full winter, if you will. If you look at our internal data on COVID, um, we've had pretty low numbers throughout. Um, you know, we, we had a, some high pieces right at the start of school, but since then we, we've really settled in. We've had no building that hit, no, no building with students that's hit that one and a half percent threshold other than uh, scope. So it's really down to the only ones hitting the one and a half percent are the low population buildings where one case can throw us over. So it's JB, Witzel, and um, central office that are typically hitting above the 1.5%. So if we think about how we move forward at this point, we can not change anything. We can keep adopting the resolution as is every 21 days. That would, however, necess necessitate some additional virtual meetings to be able to align that 21 day cycle with the board calendar. Um, so we would need meeting probably on January 5th and another one on April 6th so that we get that cycle. That's an option. Um, another option is to just kind of do the resolution a final time to go, this is effective through the remainder of the year that basically we're just sending out these notifications is pretty much all we're doing at this point. However, um, our nursing staff believes that we could uh, evolve that health services masking requirement from when patients are present to when res respiratory illness is present instead of just patients. Or we could just eliminate it altogether and work within the policies of that, that we have and are named in the resolution. So really kind of three options that we've outlined. So we provided a resolution that has no change. We provided a resolution that um, has kind of number two and three, if you will, among these items. And then eliminating it would be just mean we don't take any action. Or the board doesn't take any action. So here's the kind of the modified language for that kind of combination of two and three is to add or change these pieces in yellow and eliminate the piece in red. Um, so just we adopt these things to be effective through the end of the school year. And so in a clean copy, it looks like that. But with that, I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. So really, we got one of three options that the board needs to select and one of option one, if you will, of maintaining what we've been doing, just we'll, we'll have to set those two other meetings. We can do those via Zoom. But there you go. I'll try to answer any questions that you have. So if we um, adopt the, the resolution dated December 15th of 22, um, which extends it to June 30th of 23, then what happens hypothetically, we can never have, is it my understanding, we can't make another resolution really ever because we did not. Six months. Six months, okay. That's, that's the common belief. However, there still is one lawsuit lingering out there. And if we got determination of that lawsuit, that could stick at the six or we could be able to do whatever. And theoretically, if we wanted to um, keep the August 
fourth resolution, we could we could change the masking requirements in the health rooms also, right? Yes, I mean, the previous number five says that we're mask optional, right? So we were just like, if we're gonna do another resolution, we just take that out. Right. It, right, we're, but yes, we could change the numbers six. Just which way y'all wanna go? I mean, I think, you know, that six month is because of House Bill 271 that precipitated this constantly going. So if we do go to a six month one, it's possible that it could be legally challenged and kicked down. But there's been so many lawsuits that were filed on this that magically disappeared when public interest seemed to magically disappear, then would it happen? Probably not. Could it happen? Yes. Plus also the individual that's precipitated most of those lawsuits is moving to higher office and his replacement seems to follow his methodology. So it's, it's possible we could get something from the new guy. Functionally, however, at some point, we can't continue to do this every 21 days. We, just, we have to move to, we're just working under existing policy. That has to happen at some point. So we're going to kick in this theoretical six-month thing somewhere. And I'm good with that. I think it's time to move on. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I think that the the issue now is no longer COVID, but it's every other communicable disease that known to God, you know, or, or mankind. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it's and my policy move, that time covers to move on. Scott? Where did the, J, the date June 30th come from? Could it be May 30th or July 30th? June 30th takes us through the end of summer school. Okay. And the end of the fiscal year. Grace, let's do that. What do you say, guys? I like getting, I, I like that. Um, number six, I'm not too keen on because um, every other health service building in Missouri requires masks at all times whenever you walk in. I haven't been to one that doesn't require a mask, so. In the health, health rooms, yeah. I, I think that we should keep, keep the old number six. You, you mentioned that um, that was um, encouraged by the nurses, though, that language, by our nurses. To eliminate masking in the health rooms? No, uh, add in, the line, the, add in line oh. six that's up there, it's highlighted. The, the current language says when patients are present. When and given I like that. That That's the respiratory illness is the challenge. That was the change that came from them. Yeah. And, and you know, to your point, it could be, though, that, um, I'm, and I'm just thinking about other doctors, the nurses probably see it, lots of students for a headache. Or, and you're not going to be in a doctor's office when your child has, oh. right? I am always at the doctor's office without an illness with my daughter like the last few times that they've just but, been checkups or for other things yeah I don't I don't I think I was we have to, to wear say the like mask. what they probably see in their health rooms I, I'm making an assumption though is right. going to be more <laughs> than what generally you're going to take to a regular doctor because these are students that are within school and healthy enough to have gone to school that day that's all I'm yeah, I do get that. But okay. well, you know, short of sanitizing the health room after every guest, you know, we there's a, a clear and present danger that if a if a kid comes in in third or second grade with RSV, that something's going to get contaminated. Well, I was just making that point because the nurses. Recommended this language, right? And so, I, yeah, and so I think that's important to note. So we should go with what the nurses have requested in that in that item. So okay. since since we have all these options on the table, do I make a motion for one 
Do we decide what motion I'm going to make first? So we've got really, I'll, I'll go back to three options that we present. Right? One is to continue it as is. Two, to, and that resolution is on evil. Right? We also have a resolution that is this, clean language. And the third option is not take any action and then we essentially go to policy EBB and GBE as what we work, we work within those frameworks. I say take no action, let the nurses do what they want in health rooms. Well, they have to follow. No, because, yeah. Oh. oh, okay, so we, they couldn't ask, request that and just, if it's, not if it's not in the policy. Okay, so let's do that. What do you think, guys? Is that reasonable? What was that? Specifically, it, this, the one where it says. The way you just explained it, just to make sure I understand it, is the existing resolution that requires us to vote every 21 days, you want to not move that one forward again. Let go of that. And then you want to move forward the modified one, this one. That would have the language to June the, 30th. The alternative one, but with the change. Okay. Right? So make sure I understand what you were explaining. Yeah, I mean, is that, that would be That's my preference. What do you all? Well, we'll vote on it. Yeah. Um, is there any more? What, what, what do we, so what happens if this one, if we vote on this one, and what happens after June 30th? Do we have to have another vote to extend it? I mean, it, then it just automatically do, disappears? Yes. For six months, for at yep. least. Yes. For six it, it months. It will expire okay. at the end of June 30th. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then that's, we go we back. That's the way this, this one was released with that. an expiration date. And then we revert back to what was, uh, policy is and for we're, all And we're operating situations. under policy. Sounds good to me. Okay, I'm sorry, but how is this different than if we just take no action and it disappears? Because right now we're saying that through the end of the year we're going to be masked. The, optional. It would be the notifications of COVID exposure that would go out and it would be masking in the nurses. Oh, I got you. Okay, so mainly notifications. Right. If yeah. we just revert back Based to policy, right. those pieces right. don't right. exist. Okay. And then at the end of six months, you know, we can could look at it again if there's you know another <laughs> issue that we need to address. So, yeah. Can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry. It's okay. So, like every nurse has to wear a mask. Like every nurse in other hospitals and facilities have to wear a mask around patients. So, and I know that a lot of these are headaches and, and all that, but I think that it's a normal part of a nurse's job to wear a mask. I mean, if, if I could hear directly from them or have a, some sort of writing, like maybe I would, you know, right. change so, my mind. But. Uh, do you have any? input so why don't I make a it sounds like we're leaning towards with all due respect Grace I think no, we're I leaning know. towards uh, the majority is probably going to go with the December 15th resolution is yes. that correct or yes. do you prefer to vote on doing away with it totally I think the consensus well, if we strike down the December 15th one won't we revert to policy because that would be yes. no action if you yes. do neither one then it reverts back to policy so, That's never going to change. Okay, so I can I can safely just make a motion. Okay, are we good then? Any more conversation? I think we're good. Okay, are we can debate after I make the motion also, just so everybody understands that theoretically that's when we should be debating. Um, if I can get a motion, please, to approve the COVID nineteen resolution dated December fifteenth, twenty twenty two, as presented. So, so move. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jeff. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries 6 1. All right, thank you. Moving on. Trotwine Elementary, Dr. Henderson. Good evening. I am um, proud and eager to share uh, the story of learning and growth at Troutwine Elementary over the last couple of years, specifically the last year and a half. 
Um, it has been focused on and interwoven with intentionality and fidelity. Our mission remains focused as a family where we are striving for academic growth and character among our students. Our enrollment is about 396. It changes about every other week, sometimes every week. Um, we are uh, thrilled to have two early childhood classrooms, our satellite centers. Um, and then additionally, uh, in grades first through fifth, we've had 49 new students join us this year. Our demographics look like this. Um, it appears that we have a predominantly white building, but what this does not show is the beauty of the many cultures represented at Trotwine. This is a celebration that we um, are so proud of. We have a team of teachers that has put together a cultural awareness group. Um, they meet, they are sharing different cultures, celebrations of holidays, um, so on and so on through announcements and with staff. Um, so I'm very proud to share with you, we have 22 countries represented in 24 languages. Our demographics uh, look as this. Our EL population is 20%. Uh, we have 43% of our families that uh, utilize meal assistance, which is a slight increase. Uh, before COVID, we were hovering around 40%. Um, we've decreased about a percentage or two with students who have IEPs, and I attribute this to the interventionist. Um, and the ability to uh, service some of these students at a tier two level before needing to take them to a tier three level. And we have 3% of our families, about nine or 10 families in transition. Uh, those are families that are doubled up or have traditionally been called homeless status. Attendance, overall, again, this changes, um, but uh, we're hovering in the upper 80s right now. I will tell you, this week we finally hit back over the 90s and we were very excited. Yes. Um, this has been a huge piece of the work with our SEL action team this year. Um, we are really trying to motivate students through just talking, spirit days, um, student recognitions, classroom recognitions every single day. We are running a school-wide PDSA cycle that's been going for two months. Um, every single day, that little study tracker, Google Doc, teachers input their percentage of attendance. Um, I share out classrooms and celebrate those each morning. Um, and then teachers also post that outside their classroom doors. In addition to that, uh, the school counselor, myself, and our secretary meet every three to four weeks and go by student by student by student and determine who we need to make personal phone calls to, who should we um, send a letter to, is just kind of an awareness of the number of days missed. We're keeping at that. Um, so, you know, getting to what we're here for at Troutline, it's really the learning, and it's the learning of the students and us as the staff. And I talked about that intentionality and the fidelity of what we've been doing, and I really credit the MTSS foundation and framework for that. Um, last year, we really took some deeper looks at the core tier one um, instruction and um, assessment that was happening in our classrooms, and really that congruence and alignment with that as well you're gonna see some real positive results that came from that. And then the cultural awareness piece has been really just embedded in everything and inter interwoven into everything that we're doing this year. Our school-wide goals have not changed much over the last many years. We focus on reading, math, and access and opportunity along with sense of belonging and attendance. Talked a little bit about this. Um, you've probably seen this graphic on the right side already this year, but it was powerful for me. Um, it talks about that tier one, and all students, whether you're in tier two or tier three, receiving access to those, you're also receiving tier one. And when we can tighten up our tier one instruction, then we, have, we can be less reactive in meeting students at tier two and three. There's, there's, still, there's still need, of course, um, but there's less need. And we know that it's, it's, a, it's the academic, it's the SEL, it's the school-wide universals, which has been, was a huge piece of work that Dr. Wood led last year with our um, school community action team. You know, we realized the kids came back and they didn't know what it meant to be a student or to be respectful or to show integrity. integrity. We really, like, as a staff, went piece by piece by piece, and we realized we have to identify what that is. We need to get on the same page and then have those same clear expectations for kids. This is where some major celebrations from last year coming out of COVID. 
So what this data represents is our iReady comparison data and reading. Um, you can see in each of the grade levels, there was an increase in the tier one, that means students meeting expectations, and a decrease of students in the tier three from the fall to the end of the year. Take a look at first and second grade. The work that those teachers did, early intervention and moving those kids and making some real, some real gains with them. Our reading data with the NSGRA that's teacher administered mirrors the iReady benchmarking data. Lots of great growth, um, great growth in first grade and second grade. You see a, a, a smaller increase in kindergarten and that's because our kindergartners um, do not have reading levels on their report card until mid-year. Um, this is just a portrait of the number of, not the number, but the percentage of students that were uh, meeting expectations. You can see the large majority of our kids were reading on grade level. Here's the math data. Again, it mirrors the, the um, picture of our reading data. And this I'm so incredibly proud of. Our MTSS work last year, we realized, and I give credit to our math interventionist, Don Baranek, she realized the number sense like the basics of numbers was really kind of a weakness in fifth grade, in fourth grade where she worked. And so she put together this assessment on her own and then we shared, she shared that with all grade levels and number sense became a school-wide emphasis last year. You could walk in a PE class and there was an interwoven piece in the instruction with number sense. You could watch kids sit in the hallway for a bathroom break and they were practicing number sense. So these increases of students meeting expectations in the spring did not surprise me. I was quite pleased. Again, amazing gains, first grade, second grade, fourth grade. It's like they were moving mountains for us. This is also really exciting because this shows us last year the standard view, it's kind of the picture of what we're looking at. You see that we increased in reading from the fall to the spring as I just spoke about, decreased that tier three, those students far below expectations. As we enter this year and we look at the beginning of the year view in iReady, it tells us that 77% of our students are on target for meeting expectations. So it says to us that those students who were with us really seem to keep those skills over the summer. In math, again, a 31% increase last year um, in, with students meeting expectations, and our beginning of the year view this year is 68%. So we're pretty proud um, to see that. Here's some longitudinal data to show you with regard to iReady. So you, this takes back to from fall to spring, and it goes back from 1920 to last year. And what you'll see is that every year we increase the percentage of kids that were meeting expectations from beginning to end of year, and we decrease the number of kids that were far below those expectations. What this also shows, though, is with longevity of these benchmarks, our students be are beginning to show us that they're performing even better on them, which is fantastic because these mirror the MAP test, and so hopefully we will continue to see that effect on MAP test. Math is much the same. You can kind of see we mean 13% to 25% way back in 1920, and here we are from 9 to 40 last year. Like, huge gains. This slide uh, has quite a bit here. So this is the student support um, beyond classrooms, and this is really important. So you have teachers, you have our Melville School District reading teachers who primarily service kindergarten through third grade. They also service students who have um, reading improvement plans. Uh, those are noted as students reading two years or below grade level, two years or more below grade level um, in grades four and five. Um, you also see on here um, our EL teacher, our academic interventionist who uh, works with literacy in grades K1 and 2, and our math interventionist who works in grades 4 and 5. So the ESSER interventionist, our academic interventionist, and our SEL interventionist have been able to fill in the holes in those spaces that we have not been able to previously serve students. So it has been quite a blessing. Um, and while the interventionists are a huge piece of the work we're doing, it's taking all of us to get where we are. We have a number, a number of clubs that connect our students, which is just, it's, it's a blessing. Our kids love the clubs that we offer. And I just kind of want to wrap up with some panorama, panorama data uh, from last year in the spring. Um, 
You know, I talked about Dr. Wood's leadership with um, our universal expectations and uh, kind of revamping that and, and implementing that with fidelity and being very intentional. And 82% of our K through T teachers, um, actually I take that back, this is not spring, it's this fall, reported favorably that their students were showing emotional regulation at the beginning of the year. In grades three through five, this is student reported. Um, and you know, I was very proud to see that they're feeling engaged and they feel that they belong. And that's, that's the core of what we want for our kids. And thinking about staff, uh, we, are, we have you know, a sense of well-being where people really love being at Troutline. It just feels good. It's a good place to be and we see that reflected in this data. I'm really proud, I talked about the cultural awareness. We started some work last year as a staff thinking about equity and biases and diversity. This year we've carried this work over into our early release and part of that time is being used as a staff-wide book study on Unpack Your Impact. And so when I see those cultural awareness and the professional learning about equity with such large gains, it says to me, we are heightening awareness, we are reflecting on our own, and that's carrying over into our classrooms. And this is, the, this is what captures it all. This is our why, these are our students, this is why we come to school and do what we do every day, and we love it and we're thankful. Thank you for your time this evening. All right, thank you, and congratulations on all of your great gains. We love seeing that. Next up is Woolwind Elementary, Dr. Dave Meschke. Woolen. Our mission is to er educate everyone every day, and that's because we believe at Woolen that everyone, whether they're an adult or a child, can learn something new every day. Currently, we have 421 students in our building, and as you see, our trend is going down over the years. However, um, our enrollment stays within the demographer's projections. Uh, he had that media, or the low, medium, and high. We're pretty much smack dab between the low and medium projections that he had made. Our subgroup numbers are stable when we look at different, uh, the previous years that we've had. Our special ed numbers though, I expect to reduce pretty significantly next year, and that's because we have 15 students in fifth grade that are gonna be moving on to um, middle school that have IEPs. When I've talked to the Early Childhood Center, we only have three kids with IEPs coming in for next year, so we're gonna have a much smaller um, special ed population. And we don't have a lot of packets in play right now uh, that are going through the system, so that'll be a little bit smaller subgroup than what we've had in, in the past. Our certified staff uh, has grown over the last couple of years due to the ESSER interventionists and then also the district-funded interventionists. You'll notice that last year we had um, 10 transfers with inside the building. This allowed me to completely renovate a grade level that was ready for some new challenges. The teachers all were able to get into positions that they were more desirable for them. And um, it also allowed us to add experienced teachers into those ESSER intervention positions, which was something that has been phenomenal, especially um, for that SEL and for that math position that we have. Now I'll talk a little bit about our school improvement plan and we have three key areas that I'll cover tonight. Um, I'll talk about student preparation, safety and an employee support. We try to keep or try to help our students achieve at least one year's worth of growth in reading and math. Additionally, we use the MTSS process to differentiate instruction for learners so that we can support and challenge all the students as they make their educational journey. In August, 80% of Woolwind students were considered on grade level per the iReady fall benchmark for reading. Um, the students in kindergarten through fifth grade took the assessment. Uh, the kids who score or who were within that third tier, the red up there, those kids all receive either LLI, phonics first, or special education support in reading. Students that are in tier two. Um, they receive small group daily instruction from their teacher, and then they also are able to take part in either in-school tutoring, we have a tutor that comes in um, during the day, uh, three days a week, 
And then we also offer uh, after school tutoring on every grade level using ESSER fund. This graph shows the um, historical trend with our iReady over the last few years. Um, and it shows that we are trending up even through COVID, which is kind of surprising because we saw a lot of regression over the past couple of years with that. Uh, and then when I, I didn't include a slide with our uh, NSGRA data, but 78% of the kids in the building last year had either scored on grade level or made one grade levels or one year's worth of growth with their NSGRA reading scores last year by June. Um, our fall benchmark data for math in iReady is exactly the same as it was for reading. We have 80% of the kids are on level. Um, same thing with the students in the red. Those kids uh, are either have uh, special education or instead of having those other supports like LLI, we have a math interventionist with our ESSER funds and he works with those students uh, only. We're very focused on that group of kids because they are two grade levels or more below expectation according to iReady. And then the students that are, would be in that tier two, they also work every day in a small math group with their teacher, the classroom teacher, and then they also have access to that in-the-day in -day tutoring or after-school tutoring. Um, and then our math scores have also trended upwards over the last several years with um, iReady. And my hope is, is that this will strengthen as we keep going on, because if you remember in um, 2020 and then even in 1920, uh, if a student was exposed, they were out for 10 days. If a teacher was exposed, they were out for 10 days. So that lost, uh, led to a lot of lost learning during those times. So MAP, iReady, NSGRA, we have lots of data sources that we can consider um, to make student intervention plans using that MTSS model. We progress monitor kids using running records for reading and in a program called EZCBM for math. The MCSS progress, our process provides behavioral and emotional supports as well for students. Students are selected for MTSS with behavior using um, panorama surveys, SRSS surveys, attendance rates, and then the number and severity of office referrals. Michelle and I meet at least once a month with every team to discuss every, every student's progress so that we can respond with interventions to make sure that the kids can progress. Our next two slides show the number of groups that the ESSER interventionists are working with. We're focused on a very small group of kids this year, and like I said before, those who are two levels behind in math or those who have six or more areas of concern on the SRSS survey. Students working with the ESSER interventionists do not receive help through special school district. Um, the math interventionist works with uh, groups of four to five students for 30 minutes a day. So he has 10 groups of four to five students throughout the day. And they work on whatever the kids' greatest weaknesses are. So like for second grade, it might be adding and subtracting with regrouping. Um, he progress or monitors them bi-weekly, and then he adjusts his plans uh, with those kids so that he can either make his instruction a little bit more difficult, moving them on, or move back a step if need be. The SEL interventionist, she works with 10 groups of students a day as well, also K to five. Um, she also teaches full class SEL lessons. She's working with fifth grade right now on being kind and using kind words. She also supports students that are in crisis on a one-on-one -on -one basis. She does our check and check out data, uh, our check on check out program, which is the data you can see on the board right now. And that's a check system to help motivate kids to um, follow the Wildcat way throughout the day. And as you can see, most of the students on here are about ready to graduate. So probably after winter break, we'll have a new group of students coming into that program. The second part of our improvement plan focuses on safety, specifically having a welcoming place where everyone feels like they belong. Our trend is going up with sense of belonging, although we have a little bit of weakness over the last two survey dates. Um, we're focused on using PBIS universal zones of regulation, and we're able now to bring back um, team building and cross grade level buddies to make the kids feel more comfortable at school. 
Um, after Thanksgiving, we have a second grader who told his teacher in ASEL Interventionist how much he's always hated school, but with the help of everybody, he now likes school and he's ready to buy some merch, he thinks. Um, we have a lot of clubs that we're offering to kids and we have a very high rate of participation in those clubs, more so than we've had in the past. Um, teacher sense of belonging is going up, which is great because uh, it's allowing us to be successful with our Teton science school implementation, which takes us into employee support, employee support, which is our place-based education. So last year, 100% of the teachers voted to join the TSS program, um, working with uh, including the student's place, our place, in the world around us. And so this year we're learning about the six principles of education, of place-based education, and we're gonna really drill into learner-centered and interdisciplinary. These are the first parts of personalized education. And then my final couple slides are just some examples. Um, our fifth grade has done some stuff with Straight Rescue to learn about how nonprofits benefit communities. We did some things with how soccer is important to a lot of cultures. Um, our third graders went to learn about land features over at Cliff Cave. Um, another group of kids went to Cliff Cave to study plants and they're gonna go visit multiple times this year to see how those adaptations of those plants help the, the plants survive. And then our kindergartners went and explored how um, leaf drops happen throughout the fall and uh, what kind of leaves drop and what the impact is and they graphed what the differences were. So, so thank you guys for listening and feel free to drop by any time. Thanks for your comment. Thank you very much. I have a comment. I yep. just want to congratulate you on, I sat by there and I'll tell you what, the, this school has really got it going on and I congratulate you for that. Thank Dr. You. Mashke, I think you're, what you're doing there is fabulous. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We have a great staff that are doing a lot of good things. Yes, you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. One other quick comment. I want to say I love to see that you guys are utilizing Cliff Cave Park, given the fact that it's right behind your building. Such a wonderful opportunity. We're over there all the time. That's all. Awesome. kids love it. Yep. Uh, Thank great. you. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Special Education Compliance Report. Dr. Smith, not the one I thought it would be, but... It's still Dr. Smith. No, um, and I do would think it's going to require um, just quick board action that special education compliance report uh, is being pulled uh, until January. Um, Mr. Yeah. Smith is out, and we have some data questions from Desi regarding the compliance report. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So up really is curriculum revisions, Dr. Brian Smith. There you go. Um, annually, the curriculum directors and the curriculum team have a chance to be able to engage in curriculum conversation and implementation uh, with regards to standards. Uh, this is a time annually where we take a look at the potential of adding classes that may be needed and occasionally even archiving a class that uh, may be combined um, and essentially sunsetted or retired. Uh, that does happen occasionally and, and we do have an example of, of this. Um, Overall, this particular year, we have a total of 37 classes that, um, that were, are being brought to the board with regards to the documentation that you have in front of you. Of those classes, um, we have five at the elementary level, one new, and four that have updated standards. Um, this is around English language development, uh, all of these particular ones at the elementary level. Um, we do use the DESE Missouri learning standards, and those are influenced by the WIDA standards, specifically at the national level, or anything that's English language development related. At the middle school level, we didn't have any new classes, uh, but we did have standards updates. Most of that was around English language development or health or updates with regards to standards, uh, specifically in the area of math. And at the high school level, we did have three new classes. Um, those three were all in the science area. Um, one is kind of a combined course, but it's a new standalone course. In earth science, uh, a new course that was pulled from uh, other curriculums it called applied science. And the last one was a new course called AP Physics 2. That would be for kids who would complete AP Physics 1. Um, if 
they completed that, that would give them the physics sequence that uh, it would be for a small percentage of our kids. We recognize that, but that would be available at both high schools pending board approval. I know in the uh, original notes, it just said OHS. We may have kids initially at OHS, but that would be good for if we have any Melville High kids that would um, take AP Physics 1. They could ultimately, if, if the, you know, if their interest was there, you could also potentially offer AP Physics 2 at any particular high school. Um, but most of it is just simply uh, a referencing standards and the curriculum team, the curriculum directors go through that process with, you know, our teams of teachers that we pull in to be able to review what's currently in practice. Uh, we have a curriculum sequence that we follow over the course of seven years. That way it allows us to financially be able to keep things fairly stable. Uh, so we don't, in some years, science is a very heavily, uh, we, we, it's a bigger investment financially because of labs and resources. Uh, and especially with inflation, we tend to see, you know, rates being between 10 and 25% higher than what we were originally expecting. Um, and in other areas, you may not see quite as significant of a financial investment. So we do balance these so we can keep our overall percentage and our overall um, dollar amounts pretty stable. That helps from a finance standpoint as well. And so Marshall and I work pretty closely when it comes to doing that. So this that's a side note. This is more just about standards um, and specifically either archive classes or new classes that we will adopt every year. We tend to go through this process. And so, uh, and I try to bring all of them to you roughly around this time. It is occasionally a possibility that one could happen in January, February. It has happened before, but we're not, we don't usually anticipate that. Jean? Jean. I have a question. Do, is there some list of curriculum uh, or uh, classes that we've eliminated over the course of the last few years? Yes, that, that in terms of the list, it does exist in CIS. Uh, we can run I can, we can pull a list specifically in CIS. Uh, Andrew Coonard, our uh, Director of Data and Assessment, uh, I recently saw that list. We do use a specialized code for that. We put a letter in front of it to know that it's really no longer available once it has been uh, I'd be I'd be interested in seeing what, what we've let go sure. of over the last few years. That's easy enough for me to be able to do. Oh, That's could you do that? Send that to me? I absolutely And I'll can. share it with the rest of sure. you. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Um, if I could please get a motion to adopt the courses as pre the curriculum revision courses as presented. So oh. moved. Second. Second. Sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. So I think that was Tori and Jeff. Yep. Got it. Tori right. and Jeff. Okay, thank you. All right, next is action items by consent. Does anybody need to pull anything? We, I can get we, a motion, need, to, we need to pull um, minutes from 12-8. Because I don't think Brace was there, right? Don't we have to pull that? Yes. I can still vote, I read. You just have to abstain. I did that. check that up. I did check that out. So I am still allowed to vote so even we can if vote, I wasn't no there. No problem. Yep. Okay. Yep. I okay. All yep. righty. I know. If I can get a motion to approve action items by consent A through F. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um. Sorry. Um. Next is communications, and we don't have any open period for patron comments. Students, do you guys have anything to add? So at Oakville, the teacher versus student basketball game was Could you speak closer today? to your microphone, please? Thank you. And FCCLA is hosting their annual Presence for Pause event from December 12 to 16. They have a pet supplies collection drive that benefits four local animal shelters, a holiday theme spirit week, and pet pictures with Santa on December 18. The marching band will be traveling to Atlanta over the break to perform at the Beach Bowl on New Year's Eve. And lastly, multiple clubs are adopting families and doing potlucks to celebrate the holidays. All right. Thank you, Jenna. 
So, um, everyone's ready for a break, but that's not stopping us from just trying to have some fun. So, our World Cup bracket challenge is, <laughs> is coming to an end soon with the finals being on the 18th. Today our robotics class and our robotics club went over to Oakville to battle it out in a BattleBot style showdown. I don't really want to say who won. <laughs> Patrick was there, I think. He knows. Yep. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great competition between both high schools. Both high schools at least won a few rounds. That's a fair statement. Good. Yep. <laughs> um, our tap classrooms have been designing doors for our yearly door decoration contest. And Footloose auditions have begun for our spring play. Oh, we'll need to know dates on that as we approach it. All right, well, thank you, Eric. If I could please get authorization of closed session. For the purpose of reading of minutes of previous meetings and corrections and approval of same and other items under the Missouri Revised Statute 610.021, subsections 1 through 21, and 610.022, subsections 1 through 6. Hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting particular employees, section 610.021.3. Legal action, causes of action, are litigation, section 610.021.1. Records protected from disclosure by law, section 610.021.14. Welfare cases of identifiable individuals, section 610.0218. Scott? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Tori? Yes. Peggy, yes. Jean? Yes. Grace? Yes. Patrick? Yep. Okay, I can get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, closed session in about five